Hello and welcome to Quality Control Charts and Control Charts for Minitab 17. So today I'm going to be looking at some baseball data. If you want, you can follow along with me on the Word document that you can find just above this video on everything that I'm going to be doing today. So in particular, I want to investigate is the baseballs that are being produced have about the same circumference so that my process is producing balls that are about the same circumference. So we're going to first start by doing this and looking at the average or X bar chart. Um, I called it just an X chart here, and I'm not really sure why, because it should have a bar on it. Maybe I couldn't get to the symbol. I don't know. Let's find out. Hey, Minitab, help me out here. So all control charts are found <clears throat> under the same menu in Minitab. If you go up to stat and then over to control charts, there's lots of options here. Hey, I said hey too much. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so the first one I want to do is I want to do a uh, chart for subgroups. And, oh, sorry. And I want to do an X bar. So I'm going to click on this one. So for me, all my variables are in just one column, so I don't have to sub this by anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and click in the white box. That's how you get the variables to appear. And I'm going to put in circumference. If you had multiple samples or subgroups you're looking at, you'd want to, um, or if you had individual data, like you had um, group measurements measured, like say you had. Um, a sample of size 3 and you need to find the mean yourself, you'd tell it what the size was and where the data was located to make those subgroups, so it was making the means itself. But I have um, individual variables here, so I already have the um, samples. So if you look at this, this is just like sample number and the circumferences that are being measured. So it's already been meaned, is what I'm trying to say. It, that sounds weird. Anyway, um, I have to tell it where my ID, my sample number is. This is so it knows what order to put it in. Okay, so you'll notice it labels the mean of means x bar bar. So this is the average across all of the values you see present here. It gives me my upper control level and my lower control level, and it's calculating these automatically from the data. So it's taking all my data and it's averaging it and producing all of these. Fortunately, the data for the baseball circumferences does not work great for an R chart since it's samples with means of samples. So I'm going to go over to the Comtech Industries data that you see here. I'm going to bold that because I meant to before. So I'm going to switch gears over to a different set of data. There we go. So this one I have, um, sorry, I'm going to scroll back up. I have lots of samples, but I'm taking them off of multiple lines. So these are like my individual values for uh, my samples. So for instance, like my first sample had five samples in it. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, and this data, since I have the sample, I can actually calculate the range of values. Let's have a look at this. So we're going to go up to stat. <clears throat> control charts, and then down to variables, chart subgroups, and I want to put in an R chart. Now there's a couple things I have to be careful with here. Um, so my observed charts are not all in one column anymore. I need to change this to their into subgroups and are in multiple columns and I got to tell it which columns are in there. So I'm just going to click and drag so these all are highlighted and hit select. So that's telling it, oh, here's where my samples are located in. It's located in these columns and across my rows makes the sample, which is why I'm not including the first row because the first row is just a sample number. It's not a member of that sample. Okay, so um, I'm not going to hit any of the other options on this. We're just going to go ahead and hit OK. And there is our data. So uh, this is like a little bit what I was telling you about in the notes because um, notice our lower control limit is set to be zero. If you physically calculate this, it'll come out as a negative number. But remember, you can't have um, below zero for a lot of your limits of control. So um, because for physical data, it doesn't make sense. Like um, it'd be like the baseball one saying you had a negative circumference for your baseball. That's not physically possible. So most of the time, this is going to be set to zero. Um, You should be looking at each of these control charts and asking, are they out of control? But that's a little hard to measure on these charts as they are right now. If you're looking at this and thinking, well, how do I know where one and two or three standard deviations are away from the average? So this is R bar for mean of the range of these values. Well, yeah, we should probably throw that in there because then it'd be easier for us to measure that. And we're totally going to do that next. 
Um, one of the things to be aware of is that uh, if you need both X and R and, and R bar charts, you can do that on Minitab. So I'm going to stay within this data um, and do that since I can. So we're going to go up to stat basic statistics. Sorry, that's like habit. We're going to go up to stat control charts and then variables for some groups and this one called S X bar R. We'll do both of those together. So again, my samples are in across a row. So I want to make sure that I tell it that. So this is similar to me doing the R chart. And now I'm going to do some different things with this. So I want to change some of my options. Um, <clears throat> so first I'm going to hit data options. Woo. And then it asked me for, hey, well, um, Sorry. And now I'm going to hit OK and it'll produce both a R chart and an X bar chart for me. So the only downside to this is it puts them on top of each other and sometimes it can make them a little bit difficult to read um, in general. But, you know, it's the benefit of not having to click too much to get through this. So lastly, I would like to mess with some of the options for this. So um, suppose maybe we only wanted to look at like, I don't know, the middle 20 in our sample. So these are 50, 50 samples long. Maybe we wanted to look at, you know, some of the more unusual measures, because if you're looking at this, um, some of the samples in the middle, sorry, let me pull that back up, uh, look to be a little scary. In particular, I think this range of values is uh, mostly below the mean. <laughs> So I kind of want to take a look at these middle 20-ish values and see if anything strange is going on there. And you can do that. So we're going to go back to stat, control charts, charts for subgroups, X bar, R. I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger. It's not going to let me. Okay. So I've got these observations set up already from what we did before. We're going to click on data options. And then it's like, hey, well, which rows do you want to include? And I'm like, okay, I want to specify a certain one. So um, if you want, you can now tell it, well, maybe you want rows 20 through 40, and then you have to list all 20 of them right here. And that's one way you could do this. Um, I'm not going to do that, though. I'm going to go to rows that match a condition and click on the condition button. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, <clears throat> make it so that my sample number is between 20 and 40. So I want to do 20 is less than or equal to sample and 20, or sorry, not 20. And my sample is smaller than 40. So sample is less than or equal to 40. So this is basically saying I want my sample to be between be between bigger than or equal to 20 and smaller than or equal to 40. So that'll give me the ones starting from 20 to 40. We're going to go ahead and hit OK. And then hit OK again. All right. So now I'm looking at 20 through 40. And now I'm going to also add something in there uh, to help me tell if my process is out of control. So I'm going to hit my um, <clears throat> X bar options and click on the limits tab. And you could have done this for all the X charts and all the Y charts, we, sorry, R charts we've done so far. Um, and I'm going to tell it to do one, two, and I didn't say this, but I'm going to put three on there fun, for fun. So what this is going to do is it's going to mark my standard deviations for me. And that'll make this a little bit easier to read because I'll be able to tell, is it more than one standard deviation above the mean? Is it more than two? Is it more than three? Is it that unusual? So let's go ahead and hit OK and OK again. And this chart will look different from the one we just did by quite a bit. So let me make this a little bit bigger so we can talk about it. It's a little hard to read as is. Okay, there we go. Oh, these are still overlapping terribly. You can click on this and move them down and up. Um, so in this case, my lower limit and my three standard deviations away are really close in value. So they're, oh, in fact, they're the same. So that's why we're having this problem. Okay. This is not always true. All right, so the bars here, unfortunately, are not color coded, but we've lined up the values with them. So this is one standard deviation above the middle limit. This is two, this is three, and so on and so forth. And the same for the one here for the X bar chart. And this does give you a clearer view of, oh, how many standard deviations above or below the mean am I? Well, we saw that this has sort of a low trend to it, but at the same time, they're not more than one or two standard deviations above the mean. In fact, very few. <laughs> 
very few values are for both of these, so this is probably okay. Well, not probably okay. This is in control, yo. Because that's the words we use for this. Not probably okay. Um, and this is just a little bit of a quicker way to do this, is if you have to do an x-bar chart and an r-chart, um, I would suggest using this way of doing it that I just did, except for you might not need the sample between 20 and 40, obviously. As you look at this, the other thing to keep in mind is that you should be looking for out of control and in control processes, so you should be looking at those six items that we use to judge whether or not something is in control or out of control. Um, this is also a reason why you should always, always, always read through an entire question before you begin, because if you need both the X bar and the R, you can do it in one step rather than doing it in two, using this method. A little nicer. All right. So unfortunately, the data we've been using with the baseballs and from Comtum Industries um, is all quantitative, so I can't use that to show you a P and a C chart, which is what we're going to do next. So goodbye. We're on to, oh, not baseball either. There we go. Yay. <laughs> so um, I now need some defect monitoring process stuff. So this is keeping counts of things. I talked a little bit about how this example occurs in your notes if you're trying to keep track of how many defects you have per sample. Um, this is one way you can do it and you can do that using a C and a P chart. So notice there's a couple things here. Um, I don't remember where this company is coming from, but it, you make lots of small parts. Uh, so small that you have uh, fairly sm large sample sizes. So notice all my sample sizes are different, my number of defects is different, and they're being produced at different hours. So you might want to ask yourself, is there specific times where my company might produce more errors than others? And if so, we should monitor our process more carefully and quality control our stuff a little bit better during those time periods. And this is also very true of any type of manufacturing machine. When it's been running longer, it's a little more lubricated, it's warmer, or vice versa. As you think about it, metal expands, so it might create either wider or smaller objects depending on what you're up to. So there's more likely to have some variation amongst your samples. So here we go. So basically the number of defects is keeping track of how many got uh, insufficient measurements in those times. All right, so we have our data open. Let's go ahead and build ourselves a P chart. So we're going to go up to stat, quality, control. No, control charts. I always say the wrong one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I want to choose attribute charts. All of the P type charts appear here. And then I want to choose the P. All righty, so the next thing I want to do is it wants to know, hey, where is my variable? Well, that's my number of defects. That's what I'm counting. And then it asks for the group sizes. Now, the nice thing about this is if all your samples are the same size, you can just enter a number in here. If there is a sample size and it's located in your data, you can input your data as well, which it makes note of right below. Um, and I'm just going to leave this as it is, standard P chart, and go ahead and hit OK. If you like the labeling option we did in the last uh, Example, you can find that in p-chart options as well, so p-chart options and limits if you want to include your limits. Let's just use the first three like always and go ahead and hit OK and hit OK again. And here's my p-chart. This is a little unusual, isn't it? Woohoo! Oh, I always grab the wrong one when I try to move these so you can see them. Oh well, they're the same value. but it's nice to see them. All right, so as you look at this, you might be like, oh my gosh, that's not a straight line. What the heck is happening here? Well, for every single sample, you have a different P. So for every single sample, you're getting a different sample standard deviation. Yeah, because you have a different sample size. So you have a different N, you have a different P, P hat rather. Um, so when you're doing the square root of P times Q divided by N, they're all slightly different. Now some of them are closer than others, so this looks almost flat through here. And then some of them are more extreme, like this one's super bumpy. But then again, look at how far this P is from the mean. It is quite extreme compared to its compatriarchs. Um, but other than that, we appear to be good. There's only one stretch in here where I'm a little concerned. This tends to be increasing um, right through here. So your process might be having some troubles between hour 11 and hour 17. Um, but at the same time, it does have moments of decrease. So like right here between samples uh, 14 and 15 and between samples 16 and uh, 17 and then on to 18. So it's not completely out of control. And that and nobody here really goes that far away from the mean. I mean, this one single sample is more than one standard deviation of the mean, but it's it's pretty good. 
as far as process goes. So this looks like a really good process to me. Um, <clears throat> and I made note in my notes here about this that this is uh, called staircased, in case you were wondering why this looks all bumpy or what the name of this might be. Even though it doesn't really build a staircase, I wouldn't think this would walk up and get you anywhere. Ha ha ha, math jokes. I should cut those out. Anyway. Lastly, we're going to be building ourselves a C chart. So we did our P chart, which is keeping track of the proportion of failures. So in particular, you can say on average in this process, my rate of failures was just above 6%. Well, it's above 6.5%. Um, so it's a little closer to 7% than what you might like. But you can also ask yourself, what's my typical number of defects? The count of number of problems that you might be having, you know, regardless of sample size. So to do that, we're going to make our P or C. C. Okay, so we go to stat, um, control charts, and then to oh, the attribute charts, and we want to choose C, which is at the very bottom. Ooh, the variable I want to use is the number of defects. Notice here it doesn't care about sample size at all, just cares how many did I get. I'm not going to make any labels whatsoever, because I don't feel like it this time. Woohoo! <laughs> and let's go ahead and hit OK. Alrighty. Aha! So, upper limit, lower limit. It appears that on average my number of defects is just above 16, so 16.7 defects regardless of sample size. The most number of defects I should expect, or an extreme upper value for that, would be at 29, because you can't have 0.96 of a defect, and the lower value would be about 5. So that means that if you're hitting above 29 errors, you should know that you are completely out of control and that shouldn't be happening. Similarly, if I had put the other bars on here, you could say something about what the typical number of errors was regardless of sample size. So these are kind of useful. Again, you can use these to tell um, when your process is in control or what reasonable values are. And it helps you to develop a plan for what your company should do if your manufacturing process is producing more or less defects. Well, less would be better. If they were less, then you would want to reevaluate how you were making your decisions. Um, defects as far as products go. That's all. Hope you enjoyed control charts.